Good morning. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 278, We Are Travelers on a Journey. You can find this in your hymnals or on your computer screen at home. We invite you to stand and sing together. May we pray together. Loving God, we gather on this morning to worship you. We gather to bring you our praise, to speak of your greatness and your goodness and your remarkable grace. We gather to offer you thanksgiving, to acknowledge that you bless us day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, even when we are too busy to notice that you are blessing us. We gather to make confession that we are too often focused on self rather than being focused on you. We gather to bring you our petitions and intercessions. We long to receive your mercy and grace into our lives and for your goodness to touch the lives of those whom we love. Let all that we do and say and sing and pray in this hour bring gladness to your heart as we worship you, our God and our King. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. What a great joy it is to welcome you to worship this morning. We are so very pleased that you are here as we continue a series of worship services based on the life of Abram and Sarai. I want to say a special word of welcome if you're visiting this morning. We are so pleased that you have chosen to come. And to those of you who are visiting with us through our video ministry, thank you. We would love to have a record of your visit. If you're in the sanctuary this morning, there's a form on the back page of the bulletin that you can fill out, or you can access our visitors form electronically with the QR code there or on your computer screen. We pray that your time of worship with us today will draw you closer to God and help you realize more fully God's plan for your life. 
Now, I want to welcome our children who are with us in worship today. And boys and girls, I invite you to come and spend a few minutes with Mr. Joey on the chancel steps. Well, good morning to both of you. It is so good to see you this morning. You know, it's a little bit too bad because I wanted to play a little bit of a game that would work better if we had a little more people, but we're, we're gonna, we might try this anyway here. So this is based on a really old game show that existed a long time ago before you were born or before even I was born. And it was called, Who Do You Trust? And the concept of this game show was that they would ask a question for Lucy here but Lucy wouldn't be the one who got to answer the question. She would pick someone else who she trusted to give the right answer to that question and hope that they got it right. And so we're going we're gonna to see about this here and see if we can get, get y'all to answer questions for the other one and see how well you do, okay? All right, are you, are you ready? All right, so I'm going to start with, I'm going to have you answer for Lucy first, okay? Now. There's a story that you may have heard before of a guy in the Bible who gets swallowed up by a giant fish. Do you know what his name was? No? Uh, what about you, Lucy? Do you know who his na- what his name was? I know the story, but I can't remember. You know the story. Oh, no. Ha, huh, well, at least it, it, it always helps if you don't know the answer either. Okay, how about, how about this one here? And you can, Lucy, you can answer for her. All right, there's, there's a TV show. Uh, it's called Sesame Street. You might have heard of it. On Sesame Street, who is the character who is green and lives in a trash can? Oh, I don't know. We, you, can phone a, you can pull the audience here. There, I'm hearing some whispers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> yeah, so these, these are... This is kind of an example here of how sometimes there are people that you want to trust to get things right for you, and sometimes they just don't know or whatever. Who are some people that when you really want to get something right that you trust? No one. No one? I was going <laughs> to... I was going to ask if we trusted our siblings, but even though I kind of knew the answer to that one. Uh, do, you, do you trust your parents to get things right for you sometimes at least? They don't know everything, but sometimes. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, though. So no matter who you are in life, you are going to have to put your trust in someone. And no matter who the people are that we're trusting, not everyone knows everything and gets everything right. We all make mistakes, whether or not that trust was good. But we're going to hear some stories today from the Bible, and, and Tony is going to tell us a little bit later about how we can always trust God. God does know everything and does get things right. And even when it feels really hard and difficult to know, and when there are things that are difficult, we can pray about it and ask God for some help and put our trust in God that God is going to help us when we need it the most. And so we have all these other people that God uses to help us, but we can all ultimately put our trust in God. Will you all pray with me? Dear Lord, we are so glad that we can trust you and that you are there for us no matter what. Thank you for being there for these little girls and being there for each one of us. And may all of us know that we love you and that this church loves you. In your name we pray. Amen. This morning's New Testament lesson comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 32. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. 
And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out to in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. How blessed are we that you provide for us without fail. And our blessings encourage our hearts to faithfully give to fulfill the missions of our church and community. Please bless these tithes and offerings in your holy name. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 672, All Things Are Yours. You can find it in your hymnals or on your computer screen. We invite you to stand and sing together. As we are gathered today, we want to remember all those in our church family who are suffering from cancer or battling with it. Uh, we want to also remember especially uh, Gene Hurry, who is home from self, and Wayne White, who is home from his outpatient surgery. And now if you'll pray with me. Lord, we come this morning looking for you. 
We know that we should trust in you, but confess there are times and things that would make it easier for us to do that. Give us the strength to trust in you, O oh God. Give us the courage to not rely completely on ourselves, but to be vulnerable enough to allow others to help and support us. On our own, we see dimly, but together we can see you. Help us to come together and see you, O oh Lord. Lord, in your mercy, let us remember especially those who are struggling to see your plans right now. The wrongfully imprisoned at home and abroad, those who live under the constant specter of death and violence, the mother whose prayed for child was lost in a miscarriage, the parents who had to bury a child. The list could go on and on of those of us who wonder where God is in this moment. Let us show them the love of God. We cannot take away their fear or solve all their problems, but we can remind them of your love, O oh God. And so fill us with your love that we can share it with others. Lord, in your mercy, as we approach the start of a new school year, let us pray for all the people that will be affected. Parents, teachers, and students all must begin the arduous and expensive process of preparing for school. We pray that their store trips will be efficient and without fights, and that you have a restful break, you've had a restful break so that you can resume school refreshed. May we help those that we can in this stressful time. Lord, in your mercy. And now, Lord, we know that there are many individual needs in this community, and we offer those up in a moment of silent reflection. Lord, in your mercy. And now we got, gather up in a community and offer the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you please open a Bible to Genesis 12? If you want to use one of our pew Bibles, this morning's text may be found on page 9 of the Old Testament portion. We continue from last week. This story of Abram and Sarah picking up this morning in verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to reside there as an alien, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. Say you... Mm. You are beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say that you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the officials of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. Abram had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? 
Now then, here is your wife. Take her and be gone. And Pharaoh gave his men orders concerning him, that they set him on the way with his wife and all that he had. This is the word of God for our time and our lives. Thanks be to God. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. Yes, give, give me, me that, that old time religion. religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. It was good for the Hebrew children. It was good for the Hebrew children. What's good for the Hebrew children? It's good enough for me. It was good for Abram Sarai. It was good for Abram Sarai. It was good for Abram Sarai. It's good enough for me. It was good for my grandmother. It was good for my grandmother. It was good for my grandmother. It's good enough for me. And all of God's people said, Amen. We needed to get that out. Last week, we read the first few verses of Genesis 12 and met Abram and Sarai, who are 75 and 65 years old, respectively. And we read about their leaving their home, their family, their friends, everything they knew to go God knows where literally, and begin a new life. They're really too old to just pull up roots and go to an entirely new place. They know it's going to take weeks for their social security checks to be forwarded. All the things and all the people they care about are in Haran. So there was every reason for them to stay and not one reason for them to leave. Except that God said to so they went, trusting God's outlandish promise that God would use their descendants to bless all of the people of the world. The problem with that promise at this point in the story is that they have no descendants, no children, and they are 75 and 65. When I was pastoring in Edgefield, our youth did a very creative fundraiser that centered on a plastic pink flamingo. The object of the game was for the youth to sneak this pink flamingo into your yard without you catching them. And if they did, if you got up one morning or you came home one evening and the pink flamingo was in your yard, then you got to make a contribution to the youth mission trip. And then they gave you a bright neon pink sign to put in a front window or on the storm door 
so you wouldn't get the flamingo again. It was a lot of fun, and it was a very successful fundraiser. So one day, someone at Edgefield Methodist Church called me and asked if they could copy it. I said, listen, Denominational differences don't matter when it comes to really important things like the Lordship of Christ and youth fundraising. <laughs> so have at it. And they did, except instead of giving their people a pink sign, they gave them a big pink bow to put on the door or on the mailbox. They didn't really think that through. <laughs> until they were putting this big pink bow on the mailbox of a woman who was approaching 70. Actually, I think she had 70 surrounded. She said, I love to see people who don't know anything about the fundraiser as they pass my house and see this pink bow on my mailbox. I said, boy, that would be big news in Edgefield, wouldn't it? And yet, this is exactly what Sarai and Abram are counting on. That when they get to their new destination, they will be the first ones to bring a bassinet into their room at the old folks' home. Because Abram and Sarai trusted God's promise, they are extolled by biblical writers as models of faith. But one of the interesting things about the Bible is its honesty, even about the flaws of its heroes and heroines, including Abram in this story. Here's what happens. As Abram and Sarai are traveling, there's a famine, so they detour to Egypt because there's food there. As they are about to cross the border into Egypt, they're filling out their customs forms. And Abram looks at Sarai and says, You know, you are still a fine-looking woman. She says, Now is no time for that. He says, No, no, no. And he tells her that he has heard all about Egyptian men, how lustful and violent they are. And he is afraid that they will kill him in order to keep Sarai for themselves. So, he says, you put on your form that you're my sister, and I'll put on my form that I'm your brother, and then I won't have to fear for my life while we're in Egypt. So that's what they do. It turns out that the men of Egypt do indeed find Sarai to be very beautiful, and someone in the customs office tells someone in the Department of the Interior who tells someone at the palace, it seems that the grapevine in the upper levels of the Egyptian government is almost as efficient as the grapevine in Greenwood. And the word reaches Pharaoh himself. And Sarah is taken into Pharaoh's harem. Pharaoh gives Abram, whom he believes to be Sarai's brother, a handsome dowry of oxen and sheep and camels and donkeys. At this point, Sarai has to be thinking, what's wrong with this picture? She has basically been traded or sold to Pharaoh for various and sundry animals. Pharaoh, of course, is completely innocent. He doesn't know that Sarai is, in fact, Abram's wife. So God lets him know. Pharaoh immediately summons Abram, restores Sarai to him, tells him to keep the lucrative dowry and just leave. So that's what they do. But Sarai's question still lingers, doesn't it? Even as we watch Abram and Sarai drive away with their U-Haul trailer full of livestock, even though they are leaving Egypt wealthier than they arrived, there's something unsettling here. 
What is it? In a word, Abram. <laughs> he misses the boat all the way around on this one. In the first place, he begins with deceit. He begins by telling a lie. Actually, I take that back. He doesn't begin with his lie. He begins with his assumption, his prejudice really, that Egyptian men are so lustful and so violent that they will murder him just because he happens to have a beautiful wife. Ironically, the men of Egypt in this story are very gracious. They are kinder to Abram than he expects or deserves. In spite of his prejudice against them, in spite of his dishonesty with them, he, they not only let him leave Egypt with his life and his wife, but they let him keep the lucrative dowry that he gained under false pretenses. This whole wayward plan begins because of Abram's prejudice. Of all of the things that we have inherited from our ancestors, our human ancestors, and sadly, the ancestors of our faith, this is one of the worst. We label people, and then we judge them by their label. The whole point of God's promise to Abram was that God was going to bless all the people of the earth using Abram and Sarai's descendants. The whole point of the gospel is that Jesus lived and died for all people. And yet, we put people into categories based on how they look, how they talk, how they live, how they believe. And then we use those categories to decide which groups should or should not be included in the kingdom of God. And with which groups we will or will not share the love of Jesus Christ. The other thing that's wrong with this picture, it seems to me, is the risk generated by Abram's plan. And I don't mean risk for himself. First, I mean risk for Sarah. Once she is taken into Pharaoh's harem, there are all kinds of terrible things that could have happened to her. And not only does he risk the health and safety of his wife, he risks the very plan of God. God has told Abram that God wants to use his and Sarai's descendants to be a blessing to the whole earth. What if Sarai and Abram hadn't been reunited? What if the Pharaoh had kept her as it was certainly within his power to do? God's plan would have been lost. But Abram isn't thinking about that because he is too busy thinking about himself, which is what this story boils down to. Not to put too fine a point on it, but if I spend my days focused on self, what I want, what I need, what I deserve, what I'm entitled to, then I cannot be focused on God and God's plan. In our New Testament lesson, in an act of great faith and obedience to the word of Jesus, Simon Peter walks on water. <laughs> Remarkable. But when Simon begins to focus on himself and his fears rather than on Jesus, there's almost a catastrophe. In Genesis 12, in an act of great faith and obedience to the Word of God, Abram sets out on a remarkable journey. But when he begins to focus on himself and his fears rather than on God, 
There's almost a catastrophe. There was a true story in Leadership Magazine about a group of skiers who received special training to participate in the downhill slalom. I will tell you, I am impressed with anyone who can ski downhill at those speeds, navigating all of the twists and turns as the course zigzags. But everyone in this group of skiers was blind. They were taught the basics of skiing on flat ground and sort of gentle slopes, how to keep your balance, how to turn right, how to turn left. Once they mastered that, they were taken to the slalom course and each blind skier was partnered with a sighted skier. And as the blind skiers went down the hill, their sighted partners skied right alongside them, calling out right, left. And all of them were able to navigate the twists and turns and finish the course. Both scripture and experience <laughs> suggest that life is full of twists and turns. How do we navigate that? How do we finish the course? What might we learn from the blind skiers? They did it by constant focus, complete trust, and consistent obedience. What if we were to give to God our constant focus, our complete trust, and our consistent obedience. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are so easily distracted, sharpen our focus so that it will be not on self, but on you and your plan. We are so doubtful. Strengthen our faith so that we will trust you completely and give us courage so that trust will translate into obedience. Not just once in a while, but every day. Amen. God's Word is always invitation to the people of God. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing our hymn of commitment, number 67. If the Spirit has invited you to come and make a decision for Jesus Christ or to join with this church family, the altar is open. Let us stand and sing together as we follow the leading of the Spirit.
Let me invite you to be seated just for a moment. For those of you who have not gotten to meet them, I want to introduce to you Diana and Joe Glimp. They relocated to Greenwood about a year ago. They have been worshiping with us very faithfully. Uh, some of our Sunday school classes have already reached out to them, and I'm grateful for that. But they came to spend some time with me last week to say, we believe that First Baptist Church is where God wants us to grow and to serve. So if you join me in joyfully welcoming them, say amen. amen. I told you that's what they were going to say. And as I have prayed with you, we trust that God is going to use our church to strengthen your faith. And we trust that God is going to use you to strengthen our church and help us fulfill our mission. I'm going to take Joe and Diana to the narthex with me so that you can speak a personal word of greeting and welcome to them. Would you stand for the benediction? And now in the name of God, the Creator who has given us life, in the name of Jesus Christ, God's Son, who has redeemed us by His love, in the name of God's Holy Spirit, who empowers us to focus, trust, and obedience. Go from this place to be God's people and to do God's work. Mm -hmm. 